I think uh, we should start. Um, I guess everyone can hear me okay? Yep, brilliant. Uh, welcome to the uh, Reproducible Builds team. Um, here we've got uh, Benjamin Hoff, uh, myself, Chris Lamb, um, Holger Levson, Stephen Chamberlain, and Vagrant Cascadian. Um, so thanks again for um, uh, coming to Reproducible Builds talk. Who here has heard of Reproducible Builds? Great, yeah. I think for the case of the, um, for the video, we'll just do a brief introduction of what they are, what, what's the goal, um, just so we're all on the same page and for anyone following at home. So quick whistle-stop tour through that. Um, yeah, feel free to rest your legs. Um, so I like to outline and perhaps sort of frame this as a bit of a story. Um, so I'd like to give you a tale about three developers and getting some feedback there. Yeah, I'd like to tell a story about three developers. Um, first developer is Alice. So Alice, um, we're going to go through Alice, Bob, and Carol. Um, Alice releases free software. She's a free software developer. And she releases, um, say, a Bitcoin wallet or something. And um, on her home page, you can download the source of it or just be convenient because most people use pre-compiled software. You can also download the, the binaries. And uh, she compiles these herself and uploads them to, um, you know, wherever, SourceForge or whatever. Uh, one day she gets a knock on the door and someone says, you know, you've got a nice house, you've got a nice family. <sighs> Wouldn't want anything to happen to them, if you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, not. Uh, basically says, you know, every time you release that source code, don't, don't change what you upload to, you know, your um, Git hosting provider or anything like that. But when, when you do so, just, just make a change to the source code that I give you and um, upload those binaries, not, not the ones that actually correspond to the source code. And so she's been essentially blackmailed into introducing flaws into the, into the code, into the binary code that gets uploaded and, and essentially what a lot, most of the people use. And this is hidden from most users because the the actual source code on GitHub, Salsa, or whatever, is, it looks absolutely fine. There's no exploit in there. But the actual code that people are running does contain the exploit, and no one, no one can, is aware of this at all. So as I, as I point out, the source code doesn't correspond to the binaries. Let's talk about Bob. Bob is a um, sysadmin for a well-known distribution, um, as you can tell. And he's extremely elite, because he has a um, Fancy keyboard, which is all the rage. Yeah. And pretty cool headphones, actually. Yeah, they're pretty neat. So as I say, it's a sysadmin for a, um, um, for a big distribution. And, but un unbeknownst to him, his, um, uh, his, his personal computer, the one we just saw, was slightly compromised. And, so, and, and therefore, they managed to compromise the build farms for this distribution in this scenario, which means that all the, all the compilers, when they go to compile the software, they are introducing backdoors into the software being produced. So a maintainer uploads some extremely secure software um, to the, to the um, maintenance, to, the, um, to the, uh, the build demons, for example. Uh, but then the build demons themselves, the compile farms, are spitting out compromised binaries. And those binaries end up on people's machines. So again, anyone doing an audit of the source code, doing an apt get source, yum get source, whatever the equivalent is, there's nothing wrong here. But their actual servers themselves and users and machines and laptops all the way down the software tool chain are compromised, which isn't great. And so when they install, um, you know, do an apt get install, blah, um, the, the, the actual code and their machine is now compromised. They aren't running what is corresponding to the source. This is Carol um, in her sort of stock photo glory. Um, and, but this is actually Eve. So the real person here is, um, is basically Eve, which is the, the typical um, evil maid attack. So um, you leave your laptop unattended as you pop down to um, sort of your breakfast at the hotel. The maid comes in and installs some extras, shall we say, on your laptop. This is a problem because Carol likes to give software to her friends and distributes them and things like that. But uh, now the software can't be trusted. Um, it contains backdoors, Trojans, leaks her privacy, steals her bitcoins, all this kind of thing like that. Um, and this sort of somewhat goes against the, the four freedoms. Now, na naturally, the 
Free Software Foundations for Freedoms have a strict definition, of course. But, I mean, if you sort of squint and interpret them a little more prosaically, are you really helping your neighbor if you give people Trojan software? I don't think so. So, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. So what's the general problem here? The general problem is once we can view source code for malicious flaws, we can send it to auditing teams, we can look through it ourselves, um, et cetera, et cetera. You, most users are basically installing pre-compiled software. They're downloading ISOs um, and running them, live distributions. They are doing apt-get source, blah, uh, sorry, apt-get install, blah, um, et cetera. Uh, perhaps even just downloading EXEs and, and um, things on other, other platforms and things like that. And can we trust this compilation process? Can we actually trust what is going on between the source code and these pre-compiled binaries that we are all pretty much using? Our solution is as follows. We all start in reproducible builds. Our solution is we all start from the same source. So we agree that this source is absolutely pristine and contains no vulnerabilities whatsoever. Then we ensure that any build of this always has identical results. So, you know, I build it on my machine, I get one result, you build it on your machine, you get the identical result. And then we compare, for example, the checksums, or we basically literally compare the files that we've got, uh, the, the ones, for example, that I built and the ones that you built. And this means that if there's any deviation between these two, we can start to investigate why, and if there are, perhaps this is because one of our machines was compromised in some way or, um, we might also compare the, the binaries that have been generated from a build farm and things like that. So just to run through an example here, uh, David, um, you don't necessarily need to see that text, that's a SHA-1 sum. Um, what happens is that um, David builds a piece of software and gets a um, particular hash of 7A48. Um, okay, great, and he tells everyone, hey, I'm David, I built this piece of software, I get this particular hash. Um, then Erin builds the same software. Mm, I too get 7A48. Okay, this is looking pretty good. Um, we all seem to agree on if we start with the same source and compile, we get the same binary. Um, and then Fred builds it, and Fred says, mm, I get a different hash. I'm getting something different. Now, this should immediately say, hmm, why is David getting a different uh, Fred getting a different result here? Is it because um, his machine has got something else in? Secretly, his GCC has got some backdoor in it or some sort of clever trusting trust attack going on. But whatever it is, it's um, certainly an avenue for discussion, uh, for investigation, and to work out what is going on with his particular build. So how does this help? So in Alice's case, the blackmail will be discovered. So um, Alice would still publish, as I say, the pristine, perfect source. Um, but the EXEs and the DEBs that she produces and things like that, um, when someone else builds them, they'll get a different result. And they should always get the same result that Alice gets because it's a reproducible build. So the blackmail would be uncovered, or at least that change, the uncorrespondingness, if you see what I mean, between the original source and the binaries will be uncovered and will be questioned. I get a different result. Why is that interesting? In Bob's case, the compromise of the build farm will be discovered because someone will build the Apache or whatever it is on their local machine and say, hmm, but the build farms are churning out different binaries. Why is this? Investigation should find out the reason why. And Carol's case, her tampered laptop should be uncovered in the same way. And this basically reduces the incentive to attack in the first place because if the, if the goal is to compromise secretly or surreptitiously or blackmail someone, it's going to be of no use if you get rumbled pretty quickly or, you know, oh, we've compromised it, but you'd just be found out and maybe it can be automatically detected. So it just what's the point of blackmailing Alice if, if it's just not going to have any effect? You're just pointless. Or you maybe you might better compromise the build farm, but none of those binaries actually end up in anyone's machines. So you have it just cuts out that avenue of attack anyway. And by reproducible or build with, I get, you get the identical result after a build. I don't mean you build with the same dependencies. That's often used um, in, for example, the JavaScript world. They might use the word reproducible in the sense of you always use the same version numbers. So you aren't going to get sort of literally feature differences between two builds. I mean, you don't. I don't mean reliable builds in the sense of oh, you always if the internet is down or I'm pulling from this random. Git tree somewhere on the internet. Um, 
I, I mean identical build results. So when you compare with SHA-1, SHA-256, CMP, you literally do a bit for bit. Check at the files, they are literally identical. No tools required, just comparing the bytes. Easy peasy. But wait, isn't software reproducible already? What, what's, what, what, why isn't it reproducible right now? So one big reason is dictionary and hash ordering. So for example, in Perl, if you iterate over the keys of a, of a um, Perl hash, they're in a non-deterministic order. So if you build once, you, and the output and the build process of that um, program relies on that ordering, then if you build it again, it may end up with a different ordering, and so they end up with a different build. Um, parallelism in build, in builds, for example, um, if the output of the binary at the very end result is dependent on whether something gets built first and then gets appended to something else, that can also affect the build. Um, Timestamps are perhaps our biggest problem where you end up with, say, um, people love to include the current date in the build, for example. Um, you know, just this was built on this date and time. Okay, great. But it means that if you build it twice, or I build it and you build it, we're going to get a different result because we're going to build it at different times, basically. Build paths, you might build it in home whoever, and I'll build it in home Lambi. Again, if this gets encoded into the um, binaries, then you're going to end up with an unreproducible binary, and therefore we won't be able to play that comparison game with the, with the checksums. Non-deterministic file ordering, oh, sorry about that, is also another issue on the, for example, um, on Unix, when you do a read uh, system call, you, the order in which the files are returned are not defined to be in alphabetical order or indeed any order. Um, it just so happens that on X-based file systems, they tend to come out in the same order that you added them, and that kind of is usually in alphabetical order. So most of the time, we think that file systems are returning things in, in alphabetical order. But this is a bit of an illusion based on LS sorting them and things like that. Um, once, if a build system does just do a, a raw read uh, system call, they can, be, um, they can be returned in any order the file system wishes. And this is more prevalent on BTRFS and other file systems like that, but you just can't rely on it, even on Ext. So um, if I build it on my machine and then you build it on yours, you can end up with a different result if it's just, you know, for example, naively looping over a directory and appending a bunch of files or, you know, doing that kind of thing. Um, again, if it, the build process encodes the current user or the group or your UMask, if we have a different setting on our machines, we're going to end up with different binaries and we won't be able to play the game that we played before with the hashes. So are there any other advantages of reproducible builds apart from this um, security and etc.? So um, it also means that if you reduce all these differences between my build and your build, um, and or in just builds on the same machine after a different time period, it reduces the diff between any two particular builds. And so if you make no changes whatsoever, you should end up with no changes in the binary, which is great. So when you do make deliberate changes, so you add, remove a feature, you should only see those changes in the resulting binary. And this is really helpful for doing quality assurance and things like that. Or if you're doing, or if you're adding a feature on top or a security fix, so you apply a patch, and you, and then you, so you build the software, you apply a security patch, and then you rebuild it again. The comparison between the source files should just be the patch, but but the with a reproducible build, um, you end up with the the binary differences between the patched and unpatched binaries should just be what you've patched, if you see what I mean. And if you have all sorts of other changes, then you've probably screwed up, and you probably want to be quite conservative when pushing out security fixes, pretty obviously. If a reproducible build always produces the same result, you tend to get sort of higher cache hit ratios, and so you end up saving time, money, CO2 even. Um, a very large search engine said they were saving quite a lot of time um, and essentially energy in our environment simply because they made things reproducible and said they felt they were just doing less compilation, you know, things like that. Um, you can also use it to remove build dependencies if you literally get the same result depending on um, whether you've included this particular feature or this, or this unfeature, you've turned something off, um, then you probably don't need it because the reproducible build process pretty much guarantees that as it makes no difference to the end binary, you don't need to include it in the source to begin with because it just wasn't, 
it's just not being used because it makes no difference whether you turn it on or off. So you can just get rid of it that way. You can also find a whole bunch of bugs. I don't have time to go into them today, but it can surface um, bugs of all descriptions from the rather curious and the obscure all the way up to quite severe, serious um, security vulnerabilities that we found as part of our reproducible testing. Great, and now um, Holger's going to talk about Debian and reproducible builds. Hi. <coughs> so what we've done since 2014 is kind of a torture test then, where we do two builds and vary the environment as much as we can. So we build with different time and date. We have machines running in the future. We change the host name, domain name. We change the file system. Um, between those two builds, um, the time zone and the locale, the user ID and the kernel and CPU type. And we do this to find bugs. Um, because we know then if, if other people try to rebuild, um, they will build in a different environment. And we try to emulate this. We don't find everything because we cannot test everything, but this is our aim. And um, this is the stuff you probably know. Um, got another idea here at DEPCON from Adam Conrad, who suggested to just build twice in the same environment um, to find other kind of bugs and to see if packages are easily reproducible if just the time changes. So there's more tests we can do. Um, but this is what we been, have been doing so far. And as you, as you know, we found several thousand bugs with this test. We still don't fully know if this package might be unreproducible under other circumstances, but with this we find lots of variation already and try to get there where packages are reproducible. And <coughs> when we first did this in 2013, that was still a manual test only 24 packages were reproducible. Nowadays, it's 93% without the build pass variation, because we only um, vary the build pass when testing unstable, but not testing. So this is the progress we've been having since 2014. This is um, Debian unstable on AMD64. And this big bump in the middle you see is when we introduce build pass variations in unstable. When you look at the um, graph for testing, you don't see this bump and you see the 93% here, it only reaches 88%. And a bit cut out on the very right, <coughs> there's again a little bump, which has be, um, is because of the switch to GCC 8, um, which we'll explain shortly um, what consequences this has. So at the moment, this is probably 88% or 86% only. But and we have this web page, is Debian reproducible yet? Which always says no. <laughs> or not always, in a few years it hopefully say yes. Um, if you want to find out about your packages, um, you can either go to testreproduciblebuilds.org slash testdebianblah, or you can still go to reproducible.debian.net slash source package name, and there you can see whether your package is reproducible or not. Um, it's no. Yeah. Um, so, is this on? Not on? Mike? Three. Three? This one. All right. Uh, OK, so many of you are probably familiar with the diff tool. Uh, it's a pretty basic tool, uh, and it can show the differences between two files. Uh, but it mostly only works with plain text files in a meaningful way. So um, several years ago, ah, so. Here we have uh, the output from a binary diff comparing to .deb files. As you can see, there's a lot of gibberish information in here. Um, like I said, diff is mostly only useful for plain text files. 
But inside of those .debs, you have plain text somewhere, or we can come up with ways to get it. So uh, numerous years ago, folks started building an improved uh, diffing tool, which can actually unpack archives and uh, continually unpack them until it can get some sort of information out of the archive that it uh, that can be represented in a format uh, understandable to humans. And so, uh, once upon a time, it was called debindiff, but uh, to since it was useful well outside the scope of Debian packages, it was renamed the Diffiscope. And uh, so, the basically Diffiscope. Uh, as I was saying, it can unpack archives. Uh, so you take a tarball, which maybe has an ISO image in it, which maybe has a compressed file in it, which maybe has plain text in there. And it'll go through and unpack each of these objects and then uh, sh try and show you a diff of the resulting thing. If it doesn't actually get down to something r reasonably diffable, it might use a tool that will output uh, information about the file that is somewhat human readable. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so here, I don't know how well you can see this, but hopefully uh, if you can, we'll be make the slides available for you to read directly. Um, but basically it's got a series of uh, a series of different file layers that it exposes. Uh, and then we'll show the differences between the various files at the different layers. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like a layered diff. Uh, it can produce output in HTML, uh, which makes it readily uh, readable uh, when producing a web page or something to output differences between files. It supports a few file formats. Um, this is largely due to the fact that it has a really nice plugin infrastructure. If you are using Diffiscope and it produces some binary output and you have some clue of how to turn that binary output into something more usable, um, you could add to this list to the point where uh, I doubt that we can realistically fit this on even probably two slides and as you know, a wall full of text doesn't make a great slide, but it shows you just how many file formats that it already supports. And uh, anything you find that it doesn't support, it's relatively easy to add. That's one of my few contributions to Diffiscope, is I added support for uh, the device tree blob format. And also, uh, because Diffiscope supports so many different file formats, it has a lot of recommended packages to install. Uh, and some of those are very large. Uh, so fortunately, there's a service available where you can just upload two files and it'll do all of that output for you. Um, I think there are some limitations uh, on uh, if you're trying to compare multiple files, like it doesn't do much with like a changes file or something, but uh, if you upload two debs, it will produce your typical output in a web consumable format. Uh, it can be useful to show the minimal differences in a security upload to make sure that uh, if you made a small patch, it doesn't result in a bunch of unintended, unrelated changes. It can be useful to determine why a, a given package isn't reproducible when you're testing it, but just because the uh, Diffiscope doesn't produce any differences, that's not to say that your package is reproducible. Uh, there's a much more involved process to figure that out, but it's helpful for revealing that sort of information. Um, and uh, it can, it, uh, with router images like uh, OpenWRT, um, it can be used on these things, but you may often end up with just hex dumps of raw binary data. Uh, there's probably a lot of work left to be done on that. And uh, I think I'll hand it over to Stephen. <clears throat> okay, so uh, since DebCon 17, when we presented uh, a similar talk, um, quite a lot has changed. Um, 
In the Debian infrastructure, for example, everything had to be moved from Alioth to Salsa. Um, for the reproducible build project, that meant some of the um, um, not only the repositories, but some applications had to be moved. For example, uh, the, the scripts that produced the, the weekly blog that we posted, Planet Debian, everything had to be moved to the new infrastructure, and that's um, already complete. Um, we had a sprint in Berlin. Um, we should definitely um, try to arrange another one of these sprints this year. Um, so that was at the end of, uh, toward the end of uh, last year, we met in Berlin and um, with, with, um, with, with some guidance in organization and, um, and uh, with scheduling. We, we had workshops and uh, many of us split into teams for knowledge exchange and discussion of ideas which people continue to develop the rest of the year. Um, something else uh, relatively new is we have um, this patch that landed in GCC. Uh, this fixes a lot of build path issues that we were having. Um, I will give an example later. Um, also, we, we made a decision on the project logo because reproducible build is not limited to Debian. It exists um, with the participation of many other open source projects. So we have a, a separate uh, web domain and uh, now a separate logo. Um, we, we're still most of us Debian developers, but of course um, we have people from other projects participating. Um, so the build path issue that I mentioned, um, yeah, this when, when we started when we when we started to consider um, um, normalization of the build path as essential to our definition of reproducible builds, uh, we realized that um, GCC often embeds the, the build path. For example, when we compile this relatively simple test case, like so, um, the directory in which we ran the compiler um, gets embedded as a string somewhere inside of the executable, um, which could be, uh, could be considered a privacy violation in a way if the developer's name or pseudonym gets embedded in the binary that they distribute. Um, also in an organization, maybe um, maybe it leaks some internal information about the, the server infrastructure. So we ideally do not want build paths to be embedded in executables, but so long as they are, um, we, we do have this patch in GCC now that Shimon worked on, who was um, paid to, to work on this project. Um, this adds a new parameter to GCC. So when we compile the same test case with this extra parameter, then all occurrences of our local build path will be re replaced with something uh, normalized. And this makes reproducible builds much easier. Um, that said, there are many, many um, many other ways that a build path can end up inside of a binary. For example, it's not only GCC, but compilers for, um, uh, or tools for, for generating PDF, um, Cython, I've seen, OCaml, Erlang, Golang, so um, tools comp or compilers for many other languages or binaries um, may also embed a build path. So um, to get the last 7% of packages fully reproducible, we, we need to consider some um, other workaround. So just, just to give a hello, yeah. an overview about other projects. Is this on? 
Other projects um, which do also reproducible builds or are working on it, Arch Linux is at 80%, um, mostly because the way they install Python packages, they put the Python packages in the package while Debian installs them at installation time so that the Python pass ends up there. Um, OpenSUSE has reached 93% like Debian. Um, NetBSD and FreeBSD have reached 100% for their base systems, not for the whole ports collection, but the base system can be reproducible because they, um, they don't do it yet, but they have shown that it's possible. They, they, they lack the, the source code is ready, but the, the infrastructure not, which is the part Benjamin will explain for the Debian stuff. We need to hurry up a bit, I guess, by the way. Tails creates 100% reproducible ISO images. Out those the ISOs are reproducible. They are made reproducible out of unreproducible packages. Um, OpenWT and Coreboot also reach 100% um, for some targets. And there's also work on Yocto, Angular, and other stuff. Um, so. <coughs> Yeah. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, now that uh, a lot of uh, work has flown into uh, achieving reproducibility, the question is uh, how can we uh, bring the property to our users in a way that uh, they can uh, have a high level of confidence uh, that all the binaries uh, they run are actually built uh, reproducibly. And the uh, core idea uh, that we are going to use is uh, that we will try very, very hard uh, to make sure that uh, every uh, installation uh, sees the exact uh, same uh, metadata and uh, packages uh, from the archive. And this uh, should hold true even if uh, components of the central infrastructure, uh, critical components, uh, even such as the signing key, uh, are compromised. So um, that's a property we currently uh, don't have, that we uh, can have, um, and that uh, perhaps we uh, should have. And uh, this gives us uh, the nice uh, property that uh, all verifications that we do on the uh, packages are directly transferable to every installation and there can be no doubt that it's um, applicable to a particular installation. Now, in order to do this, we need some additional uh, infrastructure. So uh, we uh, would uh, add a uh, log server, uh, like in certificate uh, transparency, approximately. Uh, there needs to be an augmentation of the apt client with some uh, verification parts. And uh, we also have uh, verification uh, components that uh, verify that the uh, log server and the uh, archive uh, uh, behave appropriately, so to say, and in uh, particular, um, they can uh, verify the property of reproducible builds on the uh, archive. And uh, now we're in the nice situation that uh, any monitor, um, and anybody can run such a monitor, any monitor can uh, detect a violation of the uh, reproducible uh, builds uh, property, and um, this uh, is uh, directly uh, applicable to everyone uh, who runs the uh, who runs the Debian uh, software on their uh, machines, because everybody has the same uh, view on the on the archive. So. Um, any monitor can uh, detect uh, reproducibility uh, problems and um, we uh, can benefit uh, from the, this uh, detection mechanism and the absence of uh, any uh, alarm uh, can uh, have us uh, assured that, uh, well, reproducibility is uh, indeed uh, something that we can uh, take as a given. Um, there is uh, some more information on this in my uh, DEPCONF talk that happened uh, previously. You find the slides here. Uh, there's code for a, a prototype. Uh, you find the repository here. Uh, the code will move uh, out of this um, as it's uh, converted to uh, patches for uh, the actual uh, Debian uh, components. If you have uh, any uh, ideas or concerns or feedback, please do feel free to email me. That's my uh, email address here. And of course, there are also uh, other interesting projects uh, working in the area, for example, the uh, in uh, Todo uh, project. Okay. Um, we are a bit in a hurry. Um, we prepared the talk a bit last minute, so I'd like to correct Ben. Please don't just send a mail to Ben. Send it to our mailing list so we can test it and open, because it's really, it's all, this is material for Buster plus one probably. And as said, this is in total stuff, and we don't really know what to do. For Debian Buster, you know we have this in policy. Packages should be reproducible. Um, that's, in fact, an achievement. 
um, during DEPCON 17 last year. Um, but there's more problems what are missing for Buster now. Um, we don't have Debian installer images yet. So this is the bug in case you want to read more about this. So the DI images are not reproducible. Um, we are not comparing packages against the archive yet. We just compare with our builds. Um, and funding, yeah, this is another topic. Um, actually, um, about funding, I'll be funded to work on the last thing there in this list from December, September starting. But besides that, our funding as a group, we had four people funded working on this, and that has run out since uh, the end of last year, which has led to some, we have the new progress has been slowing down. We have some things go backwards, like this GCC patch. We only had it for GCC 7, but we don't have anything for GCC 8. And we also have impact and collaboration. Um, and this is all nothing, you can do anything about it. We just want to inform you why we have slowed a bit down the pro progress. We kept, kept up our weekly blog, so there's still been lots of progress presented, though I think it was a bit less in recent times. Um, so this is something we are working on. We've we talked with quite some foundation. It's all in progress, but there's nothing concrete yet except the funding for myself for this um, work um, on this archive comparison, which is only for me because it was a fund which was only available for people living in Germany. And yeah. Um, the hardware funding, on the other hand, is still fine. We still have support from ProfitBricks, who still give us half a ter virtual machines with half a terabyte of RAM in total and 100 something CPUs. CodeSync still runs our ARM64 machines and Vagrant runs his ARM HF form with also some Debian funds. So the hardware situation is still fine, but we lack funding for the actual people working on it. And another problem, I'm very, as I said, we need to be very quick now. Debian is not wrong. Everybody is wrong. Most people are wrong. Um, because this 93% is a lie or is a misconception. Um, this, the 93% is about the sources, but we still need infrastructure, processes, and policies, and testing of the stuff, of the, if packages are really reproducible, and we need to continuously do it. Um, so it looks like some people think we are at 93%, but we are really not. And <coughs> then we have a list of bugs. Um, which are, of course, assigned to individual teams. But these are bugs that the individual teams cannot solve alone. And it's a fault by Debian. And I think this is a bit stalled, because people think we work on it, we will fix it. And we will not fix it. We cannot fix it. We need the help from teams in Debian and everybody. So the point of these bugs is to point out the problems. And so the major blockers we have is that uh, Dpackage um, and then I spilled dpackage produce. If you do a source upload, it will create an AMD64 um, build info file. This gets uploaded, and then when the build debuilds it, it's also created an AMD64 build info file, and then this upload cannot be accepted. Um, then we have a problem with bin in them use, um, where the, the build time is the same, and this um, causes problem. The bug actually has a very good uh, plan for this problem. Just somebody needs to implement it and change the way bin and use work, which is always probably not a good time now anymore in the release process. Um, and with build info files, um, the build info files are still only accessible to Debian developers, so we need to get them out to some public machine. Build info Debian net is only one machine. Um, then we would like to include the build info files in the archive so they get automatically mirrored. Um, and for security builds, the build info files are also not outputted because there's embargoed build and the stuff. So there's another problem there which we need to tackle. Um, so my fear is that we, um, Stretch we released with a package which could do reproducible builds, but we didn't rebuild the packages, so Stretch was not reproducible as it could have been. Buster lacks the infrastructure, and 
maybe even bulls or we still have not sorted these things out. So we need to continuously work on it and make sure this will I make sure this will not happen. <laughs> and the good thing is Buster is still not released, is still not frozen, so we can still change some things for Buster. So hopefully we do that. And we not we reproducible builds, but we Debian. Um, so if you want to get involved, um, visit our web page, join our IRC channel, or also we plan have another summit at the end of this year. If you're interested in this, contact us, join the summit, get involved. So thank you for listening. I think. I think we have three minutes or so for questions. So while you're thinking of your questions, um, there were two more slides that somehow must have gotten merged out of the presentation um, because they were only written about 20 minutes ago. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention that built info files, uh, there are two use cases. Um, one use case is um, for a particular package version and architecture, I want to see all the people who have been able to reproduce this package and their, their GPG signature saying that they downloaded the source and got the exact same package that I'm about to install. So this is how we can have third-party verification of the software we're about to install. Um, in order for those third parties to, to reproduce the actual .debs in that archive, um, there really needs to be some bulk download of um, what I would call the canonical build infos not related to Ubuntu, but um, I mean the, the canonical build, the official build uh, that resulted in the dot .deb that we put on the package mirrors, uh, what build path was used, for example. Um, with that information, with taking that build info and the source, uh, a rebuilder, a third party, should be able to get exactly the same result as um, the depth that we ship in the archive. And uh, it would be awesome if we could get one build info per architecture into the archive and out on the Debian mirrors. And even better, if we can get a signature in the release file um, allowing people to properly authenticate that. So that's something we need to talk with uh, FTP master on the exact details. Um, and I, I really hope we'll, we'll have that in place before, um, before the next DEPCONF. So any, any questions now? We have like 30 seconds. No question, but maybe suggestions. Because I've been reading uh, your blog entries at Planet Debian, but recently I was just skimming, OK, new packages were going on and so on. So maybe instead of just putting this wall of text, put some call of for help or call for what what is the problem or what what should be done. Be because yeah, in initially I was reading fully through them, but then, OK, some packages got reproducible, cool, everything is progressing, so cool. Yeah, I guess this is a problem that we've come to the part where the software patches are getting bore, kind of boring after three and a half years of producing the same results, while at the same time we are a bit stuck, both because we work less on it, because where the funding is gone, and also because we get into areas where we can develop ideas, like what Benjamin does, but this needs implementation from other parties as well. And we can prototype things, and this is stuck at the moment. But thanks for the suggestion. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone.